welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, honestly, probably um, out of the, all the technologies that I personally work with, uh, Kubernetes is definitely in the top five is my one of my favorites. Okay, I've been working with Kubernetes uh, since the uh, early days. Um, actually, was actually working with it before a lot of organizations decided that they wanted to take uh, Kubernetes uh, into a production type of a setting. Okay, uh, it's back in the same time period where um, uh, I think Docker was still uh, in its you know, questionable uh, growth of should we use this in production or not, right? Because those days did exist. Uh, and I think probably there's folks in here that uh, remember those pretty well. Uh, so um, I'll give you a uh, kind of a verbal intro uh, on some content, and then I'm gonna take you through uh, some of this content that we have right here. One thing that I will point out is that WebAge has done a great service, in my opinion, to you, uh, because um, the content that they've given you is what we use in courses, okay? So that's really good. Uh, so you should have uh, plenty of uh, 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 information to actually work with. Also, just so you know, um, I will be uh, using a, um, uh, a uh, local uh, Kubernetes cluster, okay? Uh, so we'll talk about uh, that. So uh, just to let you know, uh, I'm actually running Docker desktop. Uh, and right now, I uh, really don't have anything um, running in it at this point in time. Um, I am going to take you through stuff that um, uh, exists in some of the course content that, that I use whenever I'm teaching Kubernetes. Uh, and we'll talk about best practices in context of that. The last thing that, by the way, that we'll talk about is we'll talk about um, what I see as some of the futures um, in Kubernetes. And actually, in my opinion, that's fairly straightforward because we see that evolving kind of almost uh, monthly. Okay, We see uh, some of these spaces uh, actually happening right now. So. That's my introduction. Uh, again, name's John from Dallas, uh, and uh, feel free to interact as much as you want to. Uh, use uh, use chat. Uh, use uh, come off mute. Uh, and uh, let's see here. And I'm gonna get. Oh. Yeah, and so do me a favor, you guys uh, that can hear me talking, uh, can you confirm for me in chat? Nobody wants to put anything in chat. Yes, I can. No, because we are not we are not on mute. All right, hang on. All right, so hopefully we're gonna check on that. Okay, Albert. All right. Just making sure. All right, I just want to make sure because there are folks out there. It looks like they have question marks um, next to. Uh... All right, so good, 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 good. Awesome. I see the feedback now. All right, so um, anyway, uh, one thing that uh, uh, if you would, um, if you have any interaction, uh, use the uh, chat, the questions. Uh, in the go to webinar kind of is kind of wonky. Um, I'll take them either place, but nonetheless, um, the the best one to interact with is definitely um, uh, is definitely the uh, the chat. All right. So all that being said, let's go ahead and uh, dive into a little bit of Kubernetes architecture. And as I mentioned to you, um, I'm going to uh, include in here some of our best practices um, as they become 
um, relevant uh, in discussing uh, Kubernetes. Okay, so um, one of the things that we always, where we always begin, uh, is we always begin with uh, a container runtime. Okay, now one thing that I want to make really, really super clear at this point in history, uh, uh, Kubernetes is no longer uh, shipping with the Docker runtime. Okay. Uh, that may be news to you, that may not be news to you, but the uh, Docker runtime uh, actually is no longer the um, uh, is no longer the uh, center of the universe as it comes to Kubernetes. Kubernetes actually uh, is in the con is in the uh, mode of uh, actually supplying their own optimized container runtime. Okay, the beautiful thing is is that you and I can still uh, do our builds and stuff like that with Docker. Uh, and still produce uh, images that we can use in our Kubernetes world, okay? Uh, so first and foremost, as Kubernetes enters the market, uh, really it's since the beginning of the year, uh, Docker is no longer the uh, primary runtime for uh, containerization, okay? So we're gonna start off and talk about a little bit of the Kubernetes basics. Uh, we'll talk about its components, and then we're gonna talk about uh, best practices in the context uh, of that, okay? Uh, so uh, first and foremost uh, is uh, some basic definitions, okay? Uh, as you can see there on my screen, uh, Kubernetes is great for helmsman uh, or pilot, which is very interesting, okay? Uh, I haven't even gotten into the deep introduction on Kubernetes and we quite frankly already have um, a uh, best practice when it comes to enterprise Kubernetes, okay? And uh, that best practice for enterprise uh, Kubernetes uh, is actually utilizing a uh, tool uh, called Helm, H-E-L-M, okay? Uh, so Helm uh, fits right into that nautical theme, okay? Uh, and is a tool that helps treat Kubernetes components um, as uh, packages, okay? Uh, I'm gonna come back to this uh, a little bit later on, but um, I always mention that whenever we talk about the fact that Kubernetes is already in that space of talking about uh, helmsmen and things that are nautical, okay? You'll notice the, the basic history of it and uh, most often associated with Docker, that's very, very true, uh, though that is not, um, that is not the uh, the container runtime that uh, Kubernetes is shipping with anymore. I think you get the idea. So um, the initial comparison that we often make with Kubernetes and quite frankly with uh, containers is between uh, virtual machines and containerization. Uh, the reason that we like uh, containers so much is that they are so efficient. Uh, they're very fast. Uh, they start up quickly. Um, uh, once I have an image for a container on my machine, uh, to start up a new instance of it uh, is very, very, very quick, and they're very lightweight. Okay, so if um, you know if I do a Docker run uh, and I'll do it in the background, and um, I'll go ahead and use Nginx, right, like that. Um, I'll let that uh, go ahead and start up. You see how quickly that start up? Start, and I'll do a Docker container. Um, and I'm showing you the uh, basics of this, just as you'll need, just to, to kind of give a reference point. Uh, this is one of the reasons that we love Kubernetes so much. Uh, it's because of what it's built on top of. It's built on top of the container runtime. It's not as heavy and it's not as thick as virtual machines. You'll notice uh, that the image that I just started, right? Uh, actually, let me rephrase that. The container that I just started from the Nginx image the image itself is 142 megs, right? The uh, container that I just started is only 109 kilobytes, okay? Uh, so if I say, hey, let's start up even another uh, container based upon that same image, um, you're gonna notice that both of them, uh, as far as the additional size that they uh, take up is 1.09 kilobytes. Uh, they're both using and leveraging uh, a shared uh, image, okay? So um, quite frankly, uh, this is um, a significant benefit 
uh, for um, container-based uh, technologies, okay? Now, uh, as the story goes, um, it, uh, and actually, I'm trying to just essentially quickly clean up on it. HCE 843B3, let me see if that takes care of it. Uh, there you go. I'm just trying to keep things clean. So uh, back in the day, uh, we got excited about Kubernetes and said, or not Kubernetes, but Docker and said, hey, I want to use this in the production. Okay. One of the problems with running uh, Docker in production is managing it across multiple machines. Okay. So um, uh, Docker uh, has a very nice um, networking capability. Uh, all containers that you start up on the same machine are in the same network. Well, what happens when they cut across net, uh, cut across nodes, cut across machines, right? So I need somebody to handle that. Okay. I need some kind of infrastructure to take care of that. Uh, what about scheduling? Uh, what if I have uh, 50 machines out there that I want to run workloads on, uh, Docker containers and Docker uh, processes, right, that I've built? Um, I need something to manage that for me, okay? Uh, Docker provided a um, capability called Swarm, S-W-A-R-M, uh, but it does not do quite a few of the things that Kubernetes does for us. Kubernetes takes care of handling this at the um, enterprise level, okay? Uh, so that is one of the core concepts that exist in Kubernetes. The other one is the fact that whenever we use Kubernetes, typically we're an organization that has said, hey, um, let's go the microservice um, architectural pattern route. We want to build everything um, as microservices, right? We don't want to have one big gigantic deployment anymore. Uh, we want to build individual deployments uh, that together make up our application. Well, that's a good thing if I have something that's going I can use to manage it, okay? Uh, so I need something that can essentially do some basic things for me. Uh, service discovery is one. Load balancing is another. Um, uh, property uh, management, in other words, managing um, uh, configuration variables and things like that. Uh, typically in the old days, we use property files for this but I can't have an application that is distributed and my property files are spread all over the place. So I need something to help me manage that. These are also elements that Kubernetes provides. So not only does it give me an environment that I can use to distribute um, my, uh, my container workloads, okay, if you will, across multiple machines, but it also provides a way for me to solve quite a few of the um, uh, microservice challenges that we have, okay? Uh, and Kubernetes does do that um, for us, okay? So um, obviously open source system, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, it is uh, designed to scale, we like that. Uh, the other thing is that it is also uh, designed to be a core element in your DevOps um, lifecycle, okay? Uh, so doing things like um, creating new apps, um, updating existing apps, um, these types of things uh, is intended to be made easier with a tool uh, like Kubernetes, and that's exactly what Kubernetes does for us, okay? So um, there are two main uh, kind of component areas in the Kubernetes architecture, okay? Uh, and that's what you're kind of looking at right here. On the left-hand side, you have the control plane. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have all of the nodes that um, your uh, workloads are actually running on, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and give you another best practice right here, my friends. Okay. Remember, I told you I was going to give those to you in context. Okay. So um, every one of the cloud providers that we might use from Google to Amazon uh, to uh, Microsoft Azure all have um, native Kubernetes services that, that they provide 
uh, to their customers. Okay, so I can go out to AWS and I can actually create an EKS cluster, which is a Kubernetes cluster, and Amazon will uh, supply the control plane for me. And then me, I personally, uh, from my account, will pay for all of the nodes that I need in that cluster, okay? Why do I even bring that up at this point? Well, the reason I bring it up is because this control plane, if the control plane goes down, uh, then you cannot, you cannot manage uh, your workloads, okay? Uh, and so the control plane needs to be up, uh, the other thing is that the control plane has a um, kind of a NoSQL database table uh, where all of the information about the deployments is actually stored, okay? So um, the fact that if I uh, deploy to one of the cloud providers and that I get um, redundancy in the control plane, uh, basically AWS, Azure, GKE, they're going to make sure that the control plane um, is resilient. That's a very, very good thing for me, okay? Um, I really don't want to manage that on my own uh, and have to take care of it uh, for me or have to take care of it by myself in my own data center. So one of our best practices truly is um, use a cloud provider's uh, Kubernetes implementation. The beautiful thing about it is that if I'm using AWS's EKS, and then later on we decide that our company's moving over to Azure, then I can take my um, Kubernetes-based workloads uh, out of AWS and I can deploy them into um, Azure's AKS without skipping a beat. Okay. The only main uh, conversion that I'm going to have to worry about at that point is going to be with my data. Okay. So, um, so I, I guess that's uh, best practice. What number two uh, is use a cloud provider. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that all of the cloud providers now are providing the uh, capability. Uh, that rather than having a virtual machine uh, for each one of my nodes in my Kubernetes cluster, um, we can now use the, um, and it, the, te the technology name differs by cloud provider, but it's serverless, okay? Uh, so all the cloud providers now offer a serverless capability uh, in context of working um, with their Kubernetes uh, technology, okay? All right, so back to the architectural diagram. Uh, on the left-hand side, control plane, and then on the right-hand side, you have all of the nodes. The nodes that you have right there, I see what, we have three. Um, if I am on one of the cloud providers, then I can add additional nodes if my compute needs uh, increase, okay? Uh, so if I need another you know, machine compute capability, uh, to handle the workloads that I'm deploying, then um, we can have the cloud provider um, spin up another virtual machine, or we can expand the uh, use of serverless uh, to handle that workload, okay? All right, I'm assuming everybody's okay so far. Again, if you have a question, throw it out in chat, come off mute, glad to have them. All right, so, what I do need to do and what I do want to talk about to make sure that you understand is the components that are sitting over there in the control plane, okay? Uh, and so we have um, several different components that are in the uh, uh, control plane part of uh, Kubernetes, okay? Um, and you see them listed over on the right-hand side, okay? Uh, and then there are some components that exist down on every single one of those nodes that I also want to call out uh, to you, okay? So the, uh, the control plane uh, has an API server. The API server is essentially a REST server, right, uh, that uh, handles API calls from uh, your command line client or from Helm uh, to manage and uh, handle your deployments, okay? So the API server is kind of central 
uh, to the uh, Kubernetes world, and you'll you'll see it real faintly um, right there. Okay. Uh, you also have the um, uh, if you're deployed in one of the cloud providers implementations. Okay. Uh, you have a cloud controller manager. Okay. You'll notice that uh, it is listed as being optional. Uh, what the what the cloud controller manager essentially does for us. Uh, is it integrates Kubernetes uh, with your cloud provider, okay? So Kubernetes identifies that there's no more, uh, there's, more there's no more space left uh, processing and memory wise to actually deploy um, a brand new application, uh, then it can send a signal to the cloud provider to spin up a brand new virtual machine or allocate more serverless capabilities uh, to handle the workload. Okay, something else that comes into play about that, that's running on the, uh, the uh, control plane is what is called uh, the uh, controller uh, manager, okay? Now, um, Kubernetes by default is a, um, a declarative model, okay? Uh, so if, if I was to go in, uh, and um, uh, you know, look at um, you know one of the uh, deployments that I have. You'll notice it's all YAML, okay? And I think that those of y'all that have worked with uh, Kubernetes, you know this, okay? Uh, but uh, the uh, base, the the reason that this is a good thing for us. Uh, is because uh, these YAML files are basically uh, describing the deployment that I want um, to be created on my Kubernetes cluster, okay? And so what the uh, controller manager does that we're talking about right here, uh, essentially what the controller manager does is it makes sure that what is actually running in your cluster is what you said you wanted, okay? So it's basically um, constantly looking at your manifest in comparison to what is actually uh, running um, out there, okay? And in the event that you change something, okay, uh, then um, basically um, the controller is gonna make sure that that change uh, takes place, okay? Uh, uh, let's see, Shalish, you're asking a great question out there, my friend. Uh, yours is when you say KH native servers provided by a cloud provider, does it mean that there is no additional charge to use this? So let me, and I'm glad you asked that because um, we want to make sure that this is really clear. Um, when it comes to Kubernetes in our cloud providers, um, we're usually uh, not charged a whole lot for the control plane, okay? Because quite frankly, the control plane uh, uh, only it has some components that are fairly straightforward for you know Amazon or Microsoft or Google to actually host. What you and I are charged for uh, is the compute, right? Uh, so um, I think that their accountants have done the math uh, <laughs> to basically um, get the idea that uh, you know if we uh, give you uh, some breaks in the uh, control plane, we'll more than make up with uh, what you uh, spend on compute uh, when it comes to Kubernetes. So great question, great question. All right, uh, so the controller manager, we just got through talking about what that does, okay? Uh, so one thing I want you to understand about the infrastructure that Kubernetes basically implements, um, it is very, much a loosely coupled infrastructure, okay? So um, the API server receives a request from the client, okay? Uh, so whenever I do, uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, a Kubernetes command where I'm getting a list of everything that's out there, uh, that's making a call against the API server, okay? So the API server receives the communication that's necessary um, from the components that make up the system. Each one of the other components has a specific role that it plays, okay? 
so you'll notice that the uh, cloud, uh, actually the controller manager, which is this guy right here, uh, is responsible for making sure that your manifest files that you've deployed in the Kubernetes match what is uh, actually running out there. Actually, let me say that a different way. It makes sure that what's running out there matches your manifest, okay? Because your manifest is basically the contract. You're saying what you want, okay? And uh, the controller manager makes sure that uh, what is running on the cluster matches that manifest file, okay? All right, everybody good? I'm taking it, awesome. All right, so based on that, uh, there is got to be a place where information about the um, uh, about the um, deployments that you've made are actually stored, right? Uh, well, that's what the uh, that's what etcd uh, is used for, and that's what that this one is right here. etcd uh, is essentially a really fairly straightforward uh, NoSQL table. Uh, that holds all the information about um, uh, what manifests uh, have been submitted and what their current status is uh, on your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, uh, so basically, it's your it's your persistent store uh, that Kubernetes uses uh, for uh, managing management uh, purchase uh, purposes. Okay, all right. Last but not least um, on the control plane um, is that one at the bottom. It's called the scheduler, okay, right before the control plane. Uh, so the scheduler uh, is responsible uh, for determining where the workload that you're submitting is going to run, okay? Uh, so um, let me go ahead and uh, inject best practice number three for you then, okay? Um, so if the scheduler has the capability to choose any one of the nodes that is a part of my Kubernetes cluster to run your workload on, okay, um, it means that at another point in time, if let's say your workload has a problem and it uh, goes down, then the scheduler could be called upon to reschedule your workload onto a different node, okay? You want to build your services that you're going to host in, in Kubernetes in a stateless fashion, okay? Statelessness is, is going to be your one of your best friends when it comes to um, working with applications that you're going to deploy in this environment, okay? Um, don't build something, okay? Do not build something that requires that every time that it's scheduled, or if it has to be moved because there's been a problem in the um, uh, the uh, architecture, the ecosystem, or in the in the running workload itself, don't don't hard code anything in there that requires uh, the same machine to be used every single time. Okay, uh, and also don't put anything in there that uh, holds data in memory at the in the application tier okay when it comes to data storage in kubernetes uh you want to separate it from the application tier okay you don't want to do what we used to do uh in the uh in the java world back in the day where we'd have a web session and we'd put a ton of stuff in the web session that day is over with we don't want to live that way uh, we want to take um any storage that we need, any persistence that we need, and we want to separate it from the um, we want to separate it from the application tier. Okay, so um, if you want to talk about a really important best practice, the way that you design that application, uh, you want to be a, you want to approach it in a stateless fashion. No state should be held in the application tier. Okay, uh, you really want it to be separate from that. All right, which obviously means that you know any data storage that I have uh, obviously is going to be in a database service, maybe running in the cloud, uh, or it could be a database service that's being hosted by uh, another container. Uh, where that data is actually stored, 
Uh, it should never be stored directly on the uh, hosts that are running uh, these uh, workloads. They should always be stored external to these machines um, onto, I don't know, the, you know, AWS's uh, data services, right? Uh, could be relational, could be NoSQL, but I think you get the idea. Separate out your data tiers from your processing tiers, make your processing tiers stateless, okay? It's an incredibly important, um, and your, your, your life will be a lot better if you follow that rule um, as well, okay? And by the way, just to let you know, I'm gonna give you a lot more than five Kubernetes of best practices. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the ones that, um, having worked with several uh, decent sized companies, uh, that um, uh, we've learned, okay? So I, I've had the opportunity to work with like Starbucks, Walmart, um, VMware, and other companies like that. Um, I wanna make sure that we take best practices that came from those companies and we actually bring them in uh, to our discussion right here. All right, so I've talked about the API server, talked about the cloud controller, uh, talked about the control manager, uh, talked about the etcd, which is our storage, uh, and I've also uh, talked about the scheduler, okay? Uh, and remember, what the scheduler's purpose in life is uh, to um, uh, determine where your workload is going to run, okay? And we'll talk more about components here in a minute. Uh, so th these are those are all elements that are running on the control plane, okay? Uh, so basically, they act as uh, the um, uh, controlling elements that basically are used to manage uh, the workloads that you have running on Kubernetes, okay? Now, on every single one of the nodes that is a part of your cluster where the workloads are actually running, okay? And I want to make sure that we're real clear about this. Um, your workloads will never run on the control plane. They'll never run on the master server, okay? They will always run on one of the nodes, okay? Uh, and in order to facilitate that, um, the, uh, the node has a couple of elements that are running on it uh, to make that possible, okay? The uh, first element is called kubelet, K-U-B-E-L-E-T, okay? Basically, Kubelet acts as a, an agent uh, for the Kubernetes um, world, okay? And I'll, I'm gonna walk you through kind of a workflow uh, on how the scheduling happens, and you'll see where Kubelet um, comes into play, okay? But Kubelet is running on every single node uh, inside of your uh, K8's cluster, okay? The other thing that's running on those nodes is a proxy, okay? Uh, a proxy service is there to uh, uh, manage networking uh, because um, it, might as well talk about it, right? It's important to understand the way the networking is done in Kubernetes, right? Uh, is that if you remember the, um, the containers in Docker, uh, every container, uh, can be seen by other containers uh, when it's when they're on the same um, network, okay? And that network can cut across hosts. Well, Kubernetes operates no differently than that, okay? Uh, so um, in order for routes uh, from one uh, component, one workload running on one node to be routed to a workload running on another node, okay? Uh, there has to be some type of mechanism uh, that makes that routing information available and makes that um, routing uh, actually possible. And that's what the Kube proxy um, actually does, okay? So those are all your components, my friends. And what we have three best practices in so far, not bad for the first 40 minutes, okay? So let's keep rolling. All right, so, um, if you're looking for a, uh, a list of best practice, or not of best practices, but about the components uh, that are within inside Kubernetes, this is a great list. And guess what? <laughs> you're gonna get some more best practices out of this list. <laughs> so cluster, basically um, 
We're going to have um, uh, possibly a couple of master nodes if I'm hosting it myself um, and I'm trying to develop redundancy. If I'm operating in a cloud provider's implementation, the cloud provider takes care of that redundancy for me. Uh, and we also have uh, the worker nodes. The worker nodes, want to make sure you're really clear on that. Worker nodes is where your workloads, your code that you've written, that you've packaged is actually going to run. Okay. All right. So that's the entire thing. That's the entire, you know, cluster itself. The master node, which is our control plane, uh, basically is the uh, management infrastructure for K8s. Okay. The worker node, okay, uh, which is either going to be um, a uh, uh, a virtual machine. Obviously, if you're in the cloud, it could be physical if you're hosting your own cluster, or it can actually be serverless. Uh, basically, is where all of the workloads that you have deployed are going to be. Okay. All right. Now, when it comes to Kubernetes, as most of you probably know, um, we do not work with um, um, containers. Uh, we actually work with pods, P O D. Okay. Um, a pod. Uh, usually um, abstracts one container, uh, but it can be more than that, okay? So a pod can um, um, manage either one container, right? One Docker, if you will, container, or it could be multiple of them, okay? Uh, and basically the pod uh, is gonna be created and managed uh, by, um, uh, by Kubernetes, okay? So if you want to see, if you have not seen it, this is what a uh, manifest file looks like for a single pod, okay? So you'll notice that's my pod definition. I give it a, a key value pair right here, which is a label. And then I specify um, the name uh, or the image that I want to run inside the pod. And I give the, uh, uh, the image um, a name, okay? And so basically, uh, kube uh, CPL apply um, dash f pod .yaml. Okay, uh, fantastic. I now have a pod running on um, uh, uh, running on my Kubernetes cluster. There you go. It's creating the container right now. If I go back to it a couple of times, sooner or later, trust me, the container will be up and running. There you go, fantastic. So uh, a pod is basically representative of my workload, okay? And it's pods that basically run on all of the worker nodes that exist inside of my uh, cluster. There you go, really, really straightforward. Uh, containers, uh, though it says commonly Docker containers, that's no longer the case, okay? One of the discussions that, um, that we kind of targeted for uh yeah samuel hang on a second i just saw your question out there uh one of the um, um examples that we're talking about when it comes to containers uh so um docker is often used as kind of the main discussion when we talk about containerization okay but as many of you probably already know, it is not the only game in town as far as container technologies. Um, containers basically are built on top of what's called the Open Container Initiative, which is called OCI. Uh, and there are several container runtimes that you and I could actually leverage um, in order to maybe facilitate um, you know, a different type of uh, behavior in the container than what we normally would get with Docker, okay? So I can still build everything with Docker. The images that I build with Docker are OCI compliant, and I can pretty much run them on just about every container runtime, all right? Samuel's asking a really good question out there, and it is, can you share any relevant examples, demos, explanation of serverless worker nodes? Um, yeah, actually, and I don't know exactly um, maybe what you're looking for there, uh, but um, I am going to take uh, that uh, as an opportunity, okay? Uh, hang on one second. 
Let me bring this back up. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is really, really good. That's a really good question, Sam. I appreciate you asking that, my friend. So, um, all of our cloud providers um, have different um, uh, technologies uh, for serverless, okay? Uh, the technology of choice, obviously, out on AWS is Fargate, okay? Uh, so, basically, um, we can, uh, instead of creating virtual machines uh, for our Kubernetes cluster, um, we can actually specify that our cluster is utilizing um, uh, Fargate for the execution of um, our pods, okay? Uh, so, um, uh, the uh, scaling obviously is going to happen just a little bit differently than how it would with, um, uh, with uh, virtual machines. Uh, but there's still the capability around Fargate for managing metrics, the uh, amount of CPU that you're buying, the amount of memory that you're buying. And so you can buy, set up a Fargate uh, uh, profile that your cluster actually utilizes. Um, and then um, the cloud uh, controller uh, works in conjunction with that Fargate profile to make sure that you have enough resource to actually run uh, your workloads, okay? And so it becomes an on-demand uh, type of an environment, right? Hopefully that's kind of what you're looking for. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, and and all of them, uh, if you're also looking, and I think I may have mentioned this before, maybe I haven't, but one of our futures is we're gonna see, um, we're gonna see uh, Kubernetes uh, move more and more to uh, serverless. Okay, uh, that 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 utilization is still fairly uh, young today, uh, but you're going to see it used more and more, uh, and you're going to see both AWS, GCS, and Azure uh, begin to roll out more integrations to make that even tighter. Okay, all right. Uh, so pods and containers, you got that? Uh, you bet, Sam. Thanks for asking it, my friend. Uh, so, uh, containers, great. We got all that. Uh, so, uh, volumes, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about volumes in a couple of ways here. Uh, basically, this is what I can use to uh, store data, okay? Uh, the uh, directory that you create with a volume uh, is available from within inside of your pod, okay? Uh, so, if your code that's running inside of the container that is being run inside of that pod, okay? Just remember how that fits together if you're fairly new to this. Uh, pods have containers, right? Uh, pods basically are the Kubernetes abstraction for the container. The container can actually mount a volume, okay? Uh, for direct file system access uh, for maybe data that you want to, uh, to write out or read from. If you and I are operating in a production environment, that volume should not be a volume uh, that is local to the machine that is running on, okay? So this is like best practice number four, I think. Uh, volumes should be um, uh, externally mountable uh, uh, storage devices, okay? And what I mean by that is um, you can mount a volume uh, I'll use AWS as an example. Uh, you can mount a volume in Kubernetes to Elastic Block Store, EBS. Uh, you can also mount a volume to EFS, okay? Uh, so that the, uh, the running container could actually read and write to EFS or EBS uh, directly. Uh, it can be, um, uh, it could actually be uh, done with a uh, normal, file system remote mount, okay? Uh, you can do it that way as well, okay? So key thing when it comes to volumes and Kubernetes, you really wanna be using the, uh, the shareable uh, drive capabilities uh, that exist out there. 
Uh, and if you want another reason that it is a best practice to run on a cloud provider, this is another one, okay? Uh, Kubernetes, and I'm, I'm slowly but surely making sure that my thought is correct on this, and it, it is. Kubernetes integrates with just about every shared um, uh, storage system that is on every one of our cloud providers uh, that we might want to use, okay? So I can use it with, technically I can use it with Amazon S3, uh, EBS, EFS, you get the idea. I can do the same thing over on Azure. Um, I can use its uh, storage uh, solutions over there. Same thing with GCS, uh, several of Google's, okay? Uh, so best practice when you're using volumes, uh, you actually want to be using the uh, cloud providers uh, shareable volume uh, mechanisms. What this does for us, just so that we're really super clear on this, this makes it possible uh, that if I have a uh, shared volume that's accessible from any one of my worker nodes inside of Kubernetes, then my workload, right, my pod could be run on any one of those nodes. It doesn't matter. And if a pod fails on one node and has to be rescheduled onto another node, that's not a problem either uh, because we're dealing with shared storage uh, rather than storage that is specific to um, a particular machine, okay? So I'm assuming everybody's okay with that. So you've got clusters. Uh, you've got your um, your uh, your master, right, which is your control plane. Uh, we've got pods. That's awesome. Pods basically are Kubernetes abstraction for containers. And by the way, if you think about it, this actually makes a ton of sense, right? Uh, Kubernetes um, can work with pretty much any container runtime. So there has to be some type of abstraction that exists between the, the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem um, and the container runtime. Makes total sense, right? So literally, um, that's why Kubernetes architecture focuses on the pod. I can, I can use any container runtime that I want to. If I get tired of Docker, I wanna use something else, it's not a problem, I can do that, okay? All right, so you've got Containers, volumes, pods, uh, you got the control plane and the nodes. That's beautiful, got the cluster. Uh, what best practices are, are we on now? Are we on five? Okay, namespace, okay? Uh, so um, by default, okay, uh, whenever um, I have a uh, uh, cluster, okay, uh, by default, there are a few namespaces that are actually created, okay? And just to make sure that we're all on the same page with this, uh, essentially a namespace is, if you will, a virtual cluster, okay? Uh, so basically, um, whenever I do a deployment, I do a deploy my deployment to my namespace. You do your deployment and you do, do it to your namespace, okay? We all know what namespaces do in um, different technologies, right? They make sure that we don't have name collision, right? Uh, so that if you name your pod uh, XYZ and I name my pod XYZ, that we're not gonna have a name collision because they're in two different namespaces, okay? Uh, you'll notice that there is a default namespace that exists uh, in my Kubernetes cluster that I'm currently working on. Okay, uh, see how 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 uh, how strongly can I word this? But this is a there's lots of best practices around this, my friends, uh, that I'm going to mention. You should not deploy workloads to the default namespace. Okay, uh, so whenever I did this command right here, uh, whenever I did my uh, apply. Right, you'll notice that I did not associate it with a namespace, okay? I did not do that and give it a namespace name, okay? Because I didn't, it, it was deployed to the uh, default namespace. And so if we deploy everything to the default namespace, we're gonna have a name collision, 
I can guarantee you that. But there's something else in here that's even more important than that, right? But wait, there's more. So let's get um, let's get our best practice codified here, right? You should never, and I do mean never, uh, do a deployment to the default namespace. All of our deployments inside of your our organization should be done to a, a specific namespace. There are many reasons for this, okay? One of the uh, reasons is because I can uh, associate security at the namespace level inside of Kubernetes. So I can make it so that only certain people uh, that are part of a certain group can access that namespace. And then I have some more granular security on top of that where I can specify that you know, maybe you can um, list all of the components that are in a namespace, and maybe I am the one that can actually make changes or create. So we have the capability uh, to um, uh, to set uh, um, security at the namespace level. Okay, um, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of that security components here in a little bit. Uh, but you get the idea. Use namespaces, okay? All right. Something else that I that I want to mention at this point. Whenever you deploy um, your workload, okay, which essentially ultimately is an image, right, uh, to Kubernetes, uh, your pods, uh, the container that your pod is managing. Uh, can use as much of the resources that are on that machine um, as you allow it, okay? Uh, remember, uh, when it comes to uh, Docker and Kubernetes, uh, there is no hypervisor, okay? There's no virtualization of memory and CPU. Um, the, uh, uh, the pods running their containers uh, on your uh, nodes inside your cluster have full access to the resources uh, that are running um, on that machine, okay? So what you and I can do at the namespace level, we can set limits. How about that? Uh, and this is kind of an important concept when uh, we're dealing with the enterprise. Uh, so what it does is it allows me to create a namespace and maybe identify that that namespace can use up to 20% of the uh, cluster's resources, whereas another namespace may be able to use 40% of the cluster's resources. You know what I mean? Uh, so I can manage resource utilization across um, uh, namespaces, and I can do that at the namespace level. Very, 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 very important. Okay. All right. And you guys are more than welcome to throw any questions that you have, uh, you know, out there um, at any point on any of the stuff that uh, that we bring up. I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that. All right. So um, now that you have another yet another best practice, right? Uh, use namespaces. Okay. Uh, that namespace uh, is a very important element uh, for creating a separate place for uh, your workloads, okay? All right, Sam, uh, good practice, utilize namespace to separate deployment environments. Uh, it can be, yes. Uh, so, and, and so Sam, uh, taking that a step further, I'm assuming that we're talking about dev, test, prod, right? Uh, so there's two ways that I can do that, uh, that I can separate out dev, test, and prod, right? Uh, is I could create um, uh, physically different clusters for that, okay? And that's fairly straightforward to do uh, in the cloud environment. Or I can have um, one cluster, uh, and on that cluster, I have different namespaces for uh, you know, dev, test, uh, and pre-prod, right? 
usually I'd want to make prod a totally separate cluster. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's not a bad way to uh, uh, to leverage namespaces, right? It's a great question. Great question. Keep things separate. And that's what, you know, it does for me. And by the way, um, in, uh, in Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes really does not have a hierarchy of components, okay? Uh, so there's no, you know, nested component type of hierarchy that we um, traverse when we're doing, um, uh, when we're doing, um, or when we're looking at uh, logs, uh, performance, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so, using namespaces can be a good way to do that. Uh, so, pretty much all of the um, monitoring utilities that we might want to use with inside of uh, Kubernetes, uh, pretty much all of them allow us to monitor at the namespace level uh, with inside of uh, the cluster. So, that's a good thing. So, I can monitor individual uh, as well as namespace. Okay. We have a, a couple of other items that uh, are really kind of important for us. Uh, the first one is the label, okay? Uh, and uh, the label is a uh, very important element, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through a demo of that, how we use them. Uh, annotations, uh, basically uh, metadata that we can associate with objects, okay? And uh, controllers, basically, uh, which are used for configuration uh, to uh, identify the health of the uh, cluster uh, and all, all that kind of good stuff, okay? Uh, is the namespace typically at the same granularity as a container? Jensen, no. Uh, think of it as a namespace has multiple pods uh, that are running in it, and each one of those pods are uh, running their own containers, okay? Uh, so basically, a namespace is a, a grouping mechanism that we have uh, to separate out some of the elements that we uh, care about in a in a runtime type setting. Okay. So uh, Kubernetes, uh, as of the beginning of the year, okay, uh, I think uh, Kubernetes actually uh, is uh, utilizing their own runtime. There was talk about uh, Kirk about continuing to uh, leverage Docker just because Docker wanted to keep their, you know, obviously hand in the uh, center of the market. Uh, but, uh, you know, so um, real quickly, uh, Vamsi, okay. Uh, and I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I, I should be actually throwing those down, right? Uh, actually, I'll keep the uh, I'll keep my own chart up here. Uh, so, um, and uh, Kirk and Jensen, if I didn't answer sufficiently, please, please, uh, please let me know. Okay. Uh, so, um, and Bombsy, I'll come back real quick. Namespace is isolated. Uh, pods in one namespace restricted from networking with parallel namespaces. The answer to that is no, they're not. Uh, but we can uh, provide security for networking across namespaces. How about that? Uh, so they're not 100% isolated, but they can be, okay? Uh, so you have some control over that, uh, which is a good, uh, which is a good thing, okay? All right, so things that I've mentioned uh, so far, uh, probably the most important one uh, the most important uh, best practice uh, is the uh, use of a namespace, okay? Uh, so um, under no circumstance, and I think I can be, uh, I think I can be that strong with my words on it, under no circumstances should a production deployment ever be allowed into a uh, non-namespace uh, type of an environment. As a matter of fact, uh, to give you a perfect example of infrastructures, uh, Walmart uh, basically ties the namespace with the Active Directory group 
that the developers that are building the application are associated with, okay? Uh, so that's how the security uh, is actually um, uh, is actually correlated between the two, okay? So namespaces are actually critical um, and they are very important uh, and they're also important from a resource utilization uh, management uh, type thing, okay? Um, I also um, I also mentioned um, volumes, okay. Uh, in that uh, volumes, hmm, excuse me. Uh, so volumes are basically ways to um, uh, mount uh, drives where I can actually read and write data uh, from the container that's running inside of a pod, okay. So uh, one of our best practices uh, is. Uh, and actually, let me make sure uh, <laughs> I notate this too. Uh, so one of the things with volumes in the cloud provider setting is uh, utilizing the uh, network manageable uh, options that we have. EBS, EFS on AWS, uh, you have same type capabilities existing out there on Azure. Uh, as well as uh, Google Cloud um, uh, as well, okay? Uh, the other, I would say it falls in line with a uh, best practice uh, is going to be um, uh, basically leveraging a cloud provider, okay? Uh, and the reason is um, the reason is is that um, they um, they provide uh, the control plane for us uh, to uh, uh, you know help us manage that so that we we so that you and I uh, don't have to worry about um, uh, redundancy at that level in our infrastructure. So using a cloud provider, at least in my most humble opinion, is a best practice. It really is today. There's really not. I can't think of a lot of reasons why it would be important for me in my own data center uh, to stand up uh, my own uh, Kubernetes cluster and manage it from you know low level all the way up. That just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Okay. Uh, the other the other one um, that I mentioned in regards to um, uh, namespaces, uh, if I remember correctly, is don't deploy to the uh, to the default. Okay, uh, and um, I'm keeping a running list now. Should have done that at the very beginning. Uh, there's a lot of best practices, right, that we always bring up. Uh, at least I do when I'm working with uh, 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 customers. Okay, and yes, um, Kirk. Great, uh, great question too, uh, and that is uh, the uh, or great comment. Uh, it's fairly straightforward to move from EKS to AKS. Uh, reliably transferring control plane metadata from um, AWS to Azure. Uh, the uh, the beauty about this, um, and actually, I'm going to put this in there as well. Uh, one of the things that is going to be um, uh, helpful uh, regarding the uh, the metadata, okay, is the metadata is transferable. There will be some of the uh, manifest files, uh, the uh, YAML uh, that you're probably going to have to modify because the technologies on let's let's say we're moving from AWS to Azure, uh, the technologies for storage are named differently on um, on Azure, right? You get the idea. Uh, but when it comes to the uh, metadata itself, that metadata is gonna be recreated whenever you actually deploy your YAML files onto your new into your new environment. So if I'm moving from AWS to Azure, when I take my YAML files that I use to deploy to AWS, and now I deploy them onto um, Azure, it's gonna recreate all my metadata for me, okay? Um, uh, as far as moving uh, persistent information, uh, you know, uh, that may exist on one to the other, uh, that would be a uh, that would be a um, 
you know, uh, a cloud provider type of mechanism. Okay. All right. I, I don't know what the beep beep is, Jonathan. I promise you it's not a sound that I'm making. Okay. But the, uh, the uh, other piece that I'm going to mention in there too, uh, Kurt, uh, is um, early on um, when we kind of kicked off discussing about uh, K8s, uh, was talking about the fact that Kubernetes has a relationship with boating, right? Helm, uh, using Helm, uh, in my most humble opinion, in the enterprise uh, is a best practice, okay? Uh, and the reason is, is because Helm is going to assist me in taking all of my uh, metadata and moving it in the event that I need to do that, okay? I'll come back to Helm here in a minute, okay? Uh, and uh, we will... Uh, We'll take a look at uh, what it what it does for me. So, um, all right. So we've got labels, annotations, uh, basically controller components. We've talked about those. Okay. Uh, we've talked about I think the fact that a cluster uh, is a set of uh, virtual machines. Uh, it could also be serverless. Okay. Uh, master node determines where and what is run on the cluster. Okay, I'm gonna walk you through that real quickly in a minute here. Uh, and the uh, cluster uh, is confu configured via uh, kube control, okay? Uh, it can also be configured through uh, the helm command. And, and I'm definitely jumping ahead of myself at this point, my friends, uh, but you've seen me use kube control uh, and it actually communicates with the cluster. Uh, and make sure uh, I have management capability to do anything I want, okay? Helm also will do the same thing, uh, except uh, Helm actually gives me um, a uh, uh, capability to um, uh, work with repositories. And you'll notice that I have several different repositories that Helm works with. Uh, so. Um, I'm going to come back to this in a minute, okay? Uh, but um, Helm is a really, really super important uh, component, right? Kube control is the main command line that we use to interface with Kubernetes, right? But Helm um, has slowly but surely become the, uh, uh, the package manager of choice, and I'm going to walk you through that, okay? All right. So let's let's talk about one thing that I mentioned too uh, that's going to be I think is going to become important maybe later on. And if I can, I, I want to make the comment that understanding the basics about Kubernetes is obviously important to um, to actually utilize the framework, right? Understanding the intricacies of the components is gonna make you a better user of them, okay? Uh, you're gonna have a better understanding of them. Uh, it's gonna help you um, utilize the infrastructure even more, okay? Uh, there's, uh, so I, I guess where I'm going with that, well, the reason I bring that up is that oftentimes I have folks that come into stuff like this and they're looking for the magic tip. Uh, and quite frankly, there's not a whole lot of magic uh, above and beyond the fundamentals. Uh, but you become a better user of the infrastructure the more you know about it, okay? All right, so if you remember our master components, okay? The Kube API server, which is essentially what Kube control talks to, okay? So whenever I issue uh, a Kube control command like that, uh, it's talking to the API server to issue that command. Uh, the controller manager basically makes sure that whatever you deploy, uh, is uh, deployed correctly. etcd, if you remember, is cluster state, and the kube scheduler uh, basically uh, is it makes sure that things are scheduled uh, onto the uh, onto the cluster. Okay, uh, you can have more than one master node. Only one of those can be active um, at a time. So let me walk you through uh, how scheduling takes place. 
so I issued this command uh, where I do a kube control uh, apply uh, dash F uh, and then maybe uh, service.yaml. Okay, that's that's one of the YAML files. So what is the flow and how this happens? That's a great question. So the first thing that happens is Kube, the kube control command is talking to the API server. Uh, and so whenever I issue that command, an entry is then put into etcd uh, that has all of the manifest information, right? Uh, and then it also has a field that represents and states what node uh, that manifest is running on, okay? So uh, in the beginning, okay, in the beginning, uh, the uh, node that uh, my workload is running on is gonna be blank, okay? So what the scheduler does on a regular basis is it will pull the, um, uh, API server asking for uh, entries in etcd that do not have a um, uh, a node identified where it's going to run that workload. And so when the scheduler gets that information back, the scheduler will then go through the process based upon CPU, right, and memory. Uh, to determine where uh, to um, uh, to run uh, your new workload, okay? So whenever I do that kube control apply, all of that um, uh, all of that uh, is uh, is is happening, okay? Uh, so um, uh, once the uh, once the uh, scheduler finds a you know, adequate node to run it on, uh, then the uh, the uh, control manager will, or actually, excuse me, the scheduler will fill in the uh, the host name, okay, that that field, uh, and then the uh, process that uh, will actually deploy that workload uh, onto the uh, machine uh, is initd, okay. Uh, if you remember, we actually saw uh, those components back here, okay? Uh, or excuse me, not in the kubelet. Uh, kubelet uh, on that node is going to see that the deployment uh, field uh, was filled in, and so um, it will, kubelet, uh, deploy the, uh, the pod on that node, okay? So that's the process that Kubernetes uh, goes through uh, uh, whenever it um, uh, is doing any type of deployment, okay? So you see how, uh, you you actually can see how um, loosely coupled this architecture is, right? And um, any time a workload is gonna be scheduled, okay? Any time a workload needs to be placed on a node, it is always gonna go through the scheduling, 100%. Whether it's a new deployment, or a deployment that um, uh, had problems and is going to be redeployed. All right. Uh, so, um, uh, so I, I'm not going to go through uh, that piece, right? Uh, I'm going to. I want to come back to some other stuff here in a second. Uh, the nodes, basically physical, virtual, right? Virtual machines, we've talked about, those could be Fargate, they could be that, the pod, okay? Pod is very important. Pod is our unit of work in Kubernetes, okay? It is uh, one or more containers are running inside of a pod. Wanna make sure that everybody's good with that, okay? The normal ratio is one to one. Each pod gets a unique ID, okay? Uh, and uh, it is the way that uh, the, uh, the containers in my deployment are going to be managed. Okay, the pod gets an IP address. Okay, it's not at the container level; it's at the pod level. Okay, uh, and the reason that we use pods for uh, grouping, or Kubernetes does, uh, is multifaceted. Okay, uh, and uh, part of it is uh, decoupling. Okay, uh, and quite frankly, it really is straightforward. 
Okay. All right. And I'll, I'll leave it open to you guys. If you have any uh, additional questions, I want to make sure that uh, you, uh, you get those out here. Okay. Now, uh, right now, uh, I have a, um, I have a uh, running pod uh, sitting out there in uh, uh, my Kubernetes cluster. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get rid of it. Okay, uh, and uh, I'm gonna change this up uh, so that I can use uh, deployment. Okay, uh, you want another best practice? Okay, uh, use deployments. Okay. Uh, so the reason is, is I'll show you. Okay. So, um, VI, uh, let's look at the, uh, deployment YAML that exists out here. So, um, basically what a deployment does is it rolls up all the configuration elements that exist inside Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, so it allows me to work with labels, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Uh, it also allows me to specify replicas. Okay, I'm going to pause on that. Uh, so what replicas basically are is number of instances, uh, number of instances. Uh, Babatunde, uh, WebAge should uh, be sharing the, that presentation deck with you, my friend. Okay. Uh, so replicas are the number of instances of that pod. Okay, so replicas basically um, are the mechanism uh, for um, uh, scaling uh, a, a deployment in Kubernetes. Okay, uh, and I'm going to change this back to. Well, hang on a second. Let me look at something real quick. Oops. All right, let me look and see if I should still have my two out there. No, 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 no. Don't. Okay. Uh, so um, you'll see in this deployment, uh, I'm going to change the image uh, to 1.0. Okay. Uh, so um, it's a standard deployment um, in uh, it's a standard deployment in Kubernetes. Nothing totally 100% uh, magical about this, okay? Uh, so um, that's beautiful. I'm gonna go ahead and save it, okay? Now I'm gonna do kube control apply uh, dash F uh, deployment YAML file. That's beautiful, kube control get all. Uh, and you'll notice that um, it's uh, gonna start up uh, my, uh, uh, my pod, you'll notice that it's going to create five instances of them. Okay. And so you'll see at this point, I now have uh, five instances of uh, my uh, pod uh, running on my tiny little cluster. Okay. All right. So, um, and I'm, I'm part of this is. Uh, fundamental kind of Kubernetes stuff. Part of this is going to be kind of best practices. Okay. Uh, so what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to um, uh, access this application, right? Obviously. Uh, well, I can't do it uh, by default because pods are private. Okay. They're on their own network and they cannot be accessed. Uh, from outside the pod. So in order to do this, um, I need to use a service, okay? Uh, so if I look at my service, how is a service associated with a pod? Well, a service is associated with a pod through the, uh, through the selector, okay? Uh, or even better to put it, it's through the uh, key value uh, name that uh, we uh, give the pod. Okay, so if you want to go back and look at that uh, and I'll look at deployment, notice what the label is, app equals nginx. Uh, if I look at service uh, again, uh, what's it looking for? Well, it's looking for app equals nginx. So this service is going to route um, a um, request 
right, um, from uh, that it receives to one of the pods that has that label. And, oh, by the way, it will automatically do uh, load balancing. Okay, all of the different service types in Kubernetes, uh, whether it's cluster IP, node port, uh, or load balancer, um, is going to um, uh, do uh, load balancing. Okay, uh, so here, node port. Okay, I'll save it. Uh, kubectl apply dash f service dot yaml. All right. Uh, then I'm going to do a uh, I'll do a get all again. Um, I should see a brand new service uh, out there. I do. You'll notice it's running on 31914. Okay. So I should be able to do curl localhost uh, 31914, and lo and behold. Um, you'll see that it comes back and tells me that we have version number one, uh, kubectl uh, get uh, pods. Uh, you'll notice that I have five, five pods uh, that are currently um, running uh, based upon my deployment that I've done. All right, I'm throwing a lot at you with that one. Okay, so labels right, um, are the mechanism to be able to uh, connect uh, services with pods, okay? And by the way, I used one label in my example. Uh, we could uh, make the match dependent upon uh, multiple labels, okay? So I could have one label that, that specifies the uh, name of the deployment, I could have another label that defines if it's prod, test, whatever I want it to be, okay? So the use of labels, right, um, is a really important item um, inside of uh, Kubernetes, okay? I would almost label it, a, label it a, uh, a best practice, but quite frankly, you really can't use uh, Kubernetes without using labels, okay? Deployments, on the other hand, are really, really super gigantically important for us, okay? All right, does anybody have any comments or questions at this point? Everybody okay with that? All right, so I'm gonna go back in and I'm going to edit my deployment, okay? So let's say that um, our application has been running, okay? Everybody is really excited about it, uh, and uh, it's getting a lot of um, uh, it's getting a lot of traffic. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to add more replicas of it, right, to handle the load. Uh, so um, I'll do Q control apply uh, dash f uh, deployment YAML file, uh, and then um, I'm going to come back and I'll get all my pods. And lo and behold, what is Kubernetes doing for me? exactly right. Uh, it's updating the number of pods now that I have. Now I have 10 of those are, that are running. That, uh, that, um, uh, that service that I started is going to load balance across the original five and the additional five that I added into the deployment later on. Okay, so I uh, Again, one of the one of the huge benefits about this uh, is going to be the fact that um, uh, I can make changes in my deployment and I can apply those. Uh, and Kubernetes is uh, has no problem uh, handling those. One of the things that I want to point out to you is that what makes this possible is that controller component. Whenever I made the change to this. Uh, deployment, right, to this YAML file, uh, basically the controller saw the change and said, oh, we went from five to 10. And so basically it makes sure that uh, there are 10 that are running and it will basically put entries into etcd. Then the scheduler does its job to find the location to actually run those additional five. OK. 
okay? So I don't know if you're one of those people that have ever stayed up late uh, doing a deployment uh, in production. This is gonna make life a lot easier, okay? Uh, so coop control, uh, undo deployment. Uh, and let me see, I think I've got it backwards. Maybe using I may be using a a uh, earlier version, but basically um, what um, yeah these are my uh, deployment commands rollout scale auto scale replication controller uh, yeah I think I have an earlier version of cube control on this machine that's a bummer hang on a second. Shouldn't be a problem. Because I think it's been around, it's been around for a long time. But the idea is that um, because one of our best practices, right, uh, is uh, deployments, uh, we want to use deployments to uh, basically manage uh, Kubernetes. Right, our uh, our applications, our workloads, um, all that kind of good stuff. Okay, uh, so um, because we do that, uh, we have the ability uh, to um, get history information. Uh, we actually have the ability to um, uh, get the uh, to to roll back. Okay. Uh, we can actually uh, change uh, deployments, which you actually saw. So let's do this real quick. Let me show you if you're not familiar with kubectl. Uh, and, and I'll do this. And deployment, I think it's ng-inx. We do get all. I forgot its name, by the way, you guys. That's why I'm, I'm adding the uh, uh, deployments. There you go. Nginx deployment. There we go. That's going to help me out. There we go. So basically what it does, uh, it gives me status information. Okay. Uh, so I can actually check to see um, what uh, has and has not. Okay. Uh, if I do a describe on it, it's going to give me information about, um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, details of it. Um, and I should be able to, I think I'm going blind on this. Yeah, there, there's an undo command uh, for um, undoing a deployment, okay? Uh, obviously, you saw the. Uh, oh, I know. Here, here's one too. How about this one? I know what it is, by the way. Too many command lines, right? So there's my history right there. Uh, so I really don't have a history to actually work on. Uh, so let's actually let's actually take this one step further. Uh, if that sounds exciting to you guys, okay. Uh, so. Um, uh, yeah, I know what I, I see what I did wrong. So uh, I'm going to go to deployment, uh, and I'm going to come down here and say, oh, we're going to we're going to go back to we're going to go to version 2.0. Okay, uh, I'm going to save that. Uh, then uh, I'm going to apply it. Uh, you know, like that. Fantastic. Uh, and then I'm going to look at the history. You'll notice I have a version now. Uh, so what I will do then is I'm going to take the, uh, and by the way, curl localhost, and it's what, 31914, 31914. So you'll see we're on version two at this point. Uh, 
Uh, that's fine. That's great. That's fantastic. Uh, I think I changed that. So what I can do is instead of doing and looking at the history, I can undo it. Oops. Sorry about that. So by doing an undo, what that essentially does is it takes my deployment and essentially rolls it back. Right. So just in case you're one of those people that uh, had uh, any type of situation where, you know, you had something bad happen in a uh, middle of the night, um, uh, then uh, thanks, Elise. Yeah, I, I knew I'd get there. Too many command lines, man. I'm telling you, that just drives me nuts. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, fairly straightforward to be able to roll back. Uh, also, um, I can actually roll forward uh, as well. Okay. All right. So labels, uh, label selectors, uh, annotations. Uh, we talked about persistent storage already. Uh, quotas. Okay. Uh, now, I think I've covered the fundamentals, right? At least I, I think I did. Uh, so a, uh, I'm going to give you another best practice, my friends. Use resource quotas. Okay, and I'm going to give you multiple reasons why. Okay, uh, and so um, these are kind of the uh, the best practices that I've named so far. Uh, so far, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. I'm trying to uh, trying to beat 10, maybe get it, get you up to 20. Namespace is very important. Uh, we talked about volumes uh, and uh, we talked about the uh, parameters that we want to use with these. We want to use the uh, uh, shared uh, storage model that the uh, cloud providers basically give us. Okay, uh, so uh, use the cloud provider. Yeah, we get that. No, no deployment to the default namespace. We'll talk about Helm here coming up. Uh, deployments and then resource quotas. Okay, uh, so let's talk about what in the world we mean by resource quotas. And I think I should uh, have those um, inside of this example coming up. Let me find it real quick. And Oops. I promise you, yeah, I'll find it for you guys. Ah, there we go. I know what that is. I hate it when it does this because then I, I get to go do this. Bear with me, bear with me. I don't know why we ever allow anybody to put a space in a file name that exists um, on the uh, There we go. All right, so uh, we, we've talked about deployments, all this kind of stuff. We wanna talk about resource quotas, okay? Uh, and um, the, um, in, in this particular scenario, okay, uh, we wanna actually take a look at, and these are some more advanced concepts uh, and I'm having a hard time. What is it, Wednesday? Yeah. There you go. All right. So, um, 
one of the beautiful things that Kubernetes gives us and is literally a uh, one of our uh, one of our best practices is uh, the capability to um, automatically scale. Okay, uh, and in order to do that, um, we're going to need uh, you, uh, us, uh, to leverage uh, resource quotas. Okay, uh, and uh, if you'll remember something I said early on, uh, and that is, is that the container that's running inside of your, um, your pod has full access to the resources that are on that machine. That means CPU, that means memory, that means disk, the whole bit, okay? So what I, what I really wanna do uh, is I want to set limits um, on what um, a particular uh, container running inside of a pod uh, can actually have access to, okay? And this, this, this is an important conversation, my friends, from um, multiple angles. So this is one of our best practices, use resource quotas. And there are multiple reasons why we want to be able to do this, okay? Uh, so um, you'll notice that in this particular um, uh, section, uh, there is uh, two Nginx deployments with and without uh, deployments, okay? Uh, so, and I'm gonna show the no limits first off, okay? So this is a very basic deployment. Uh, you'll notice it has one, one replica, uh, it's run, gonna run Nginx, and then it also has um, a uh, service uh, defined in it, okay? That's beautiful, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead real quickly, uh, and, uh, uh, oops, didn't need to do that. And I'm going to clean up my, uh, my name, my, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'll just delete this deployment. Except I didn't need the F there, did I? It's not a file. All right, let's go back and take a look at this. So it's terminating that, and then to control, delete, and then we're gonna get rid of that Nginx service, right? Beautiful. We'll do get all again, and we should only have one thing out there. Beautiful. Uh, so uh, you saw what the uh, one Nginx deployment with no limits, uh, what it looks like. It looks like a normal deployment. You've seen that before. Uh, so let's look at the other one then, okay? Uh, so with limits looks a little bit different, doesn't it? So the service definition stays the same, uh, but you'll notice uh, when it comes to the definition of the pod itself, right? Uh, the pod has a definition uh, with um, uh, limits that are put on both, um, uh, and actually there's two different ways to express this. And this doesn't show you memory, it just shows you CPU, but I could have put limits on both of those if I wanted to. Uh, in this case, uh, we're limiting CPU uh, to 250, uh, that we can request up to 250, uh, space, but uh, it can go only as high as 250. And by the way, the way that Kubernetes does resource utilization like this uh, is on fractions of a CPU, okay? So that doesn't mean an entire CPU, that's like a quarter of a CPU, okay? Uh, so, and uh, Shalish, I appreciate the question. The, um, the limits, uh, which is really kind of weird, right? Uh, apply to the container that is running inside of the pod. It's not at the pod level itself, okay? So where uh, pretty much everything else is uh, focused on the pod, like networking, stuff like that, um, uh, when it comes to um, resource limits, this is at the uh, container level. And, and I, I think if you're familiar with the way containers and Docker uh, work, that actually makes some sense. Uh, 
because that is the that that's the level that we uh, want to be able to control, right? So um, let me see if I can find another example on this. Okay. Uh, oh, this is so good. Not that. I don't know if I do. I don't know if I have an example uh, that's going to show um, resources. Oh, there you go. How about that? So making sure that everybody understands resource quotas, right, are a best practice, okay? Uh, and so um, this, this particular pod example that you're looking at right here, uh, it, has, it has limits for both CPU and memory, okay? So um, it can request up to an entire CPU, uh, or actually the limit is that can get an entire CPU. Uh, the request for processing power can only be a half a CPU at a time. Uh, and then memory, uh, think of that as megs. So 256 meg is what the request starts with. Uh, and the max that it can ever get uh, is 1024, okay? Uh, so, um, Awesome. I think that's tremendous that we have that and, and that I have this in this because uh, the, ooh, um, since I'm in here, I want to show you this, okay? Uh, Use resource quotas. That's our best practice, right? Everybody's on board with that, okay? How you actually specify that is really up to you, okay? So you'll notice here uh, in, uh, in this, uh, we've specified what the default CPU and memory is. Uh, we specified what the default request CPU and memory can be. We specify what the min and max is, okay? Uh, so, what I want to point out to you, remember I, I mentioned to you the, um, the fact that um, the reason, one of the reasons we use um, namespaces is to be able to do stuff like this. This would be a configuration file that I would apply to a namespace to set the bounds that can be used for that namespace. So any deployment that's done to that namespace right uh has these limits uh to deal with okay that is a huge best practice that is one of the main reasons or one of the yeah besides security one of the main reasons that we um that uh we like namespaces okay all right so hopefully that makes some sense Ho hopefully that in and of itself has value for your time being here in in my most humble opinion all right so uh, resource quotas, right? That's one of ours, we got that. Uh, so the next thing that um, I need, that I wanna do uh, is remember earlier when I took my deployment and I went from uh, five instances uh, to 10, right? Uh, so I don't wanna have to manually do that myself. And I think that goes without saying, right? Nobody wants to sit around at their computer and say, oh, I need to add five more, so they go in and do that. What I'd rather have happen is I would rather have um, Kubernetes do that for me, okay? Uh, so um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, there is a facility uh, in Kubernetes called the Horizontal Pod Autoscaler, okay? Uh, so in this particular case, what uh, with your vast knowledge on the way that uh, Kubernetes scheduling actually operates, uh, hopefully uh, this will kind of roll right into that uh, a little bit, okay? Uh, the uh, namespace is gonna take precedence, Albert. 
container can ask for anything that it wants, right? But uh, the namespace is going to take precedence. It's a great question. The um, so um, HPA basically uh, what we do with it is that we're going to specify um, the parameters that tell Kubernetes when to add an additional instance of a pod, okay? Because we want to scale uh, horizontally, right? That's why we talked about being stateless. Uh, and by the way, that's right. I forgot that was one of the items uh, that I mentioned is the best practice as well, okay? Uh, so by being stateless, uh, we're going to make it possible for Kubernetes to scale us automatically. So what I'll do is with HPA, which stands for the Horizontal Pod Autoscaler, okay, um, it will determine based upon my settings. Uh, in this case, I set the uh, target CPU utilization percentage to be 10. Obviously, that's really low, right, for a test. And uh, basically, what's going to happen is that when the um, uh, when the CPU utilization of the pods that are part of the deployment that this is associated with breaches 10%, then what uh, HPA is going to do is it's going to go through the process of having Kubernetes create another pod for this deployment. Okay, so it will actually talk to the API server and go through that whole process, right? So what HPA allows me to do is specify min and max range, okay? Uh, using a uh, label, it's going to uh, determine uh, what this autoscaler actually applies to, uh, and then it's going to use the uh, target utilization range uh, to or configuration to determine when uh, to actually add additional um, uh, instances of the pod. Now, remember what our service does, okay? And remember that all services in uh, Kubernetes perform load balancing. So as the autoscaler, as HPA adds additional pods to your application, uh, then basically they will be available in the uh, load balancer. It will automatically add them in. Uh, the beautiful thing about this uh, is what Shalish is actually asking about, is that it goes the other way too. Uh, so when it drops below my utilization percentage, uh, then it's gonna start dropping pods. And the beautiful way that um, Kubernetes does this is that when it scales out or it scales in, it does not do it one pod at a time. It basically performs a calculation based upon the current load to determine how many pods are needed, okay? And it will decrease um, uh, by that amount, okay? Uh, and uh, so, Jonathan, you're asking another really super awesome question, 10% over what time period? The uh, so the uh, time periods, and just so that y'all are really on board with this, the time periods are configurable, okay? The defaults are three and five, okay? So um, every 30 seconds, uh, the HPA is going to check uh, statistics uh, for utilization. Uh, if a uh, scale out event has not happened within the last three minutes, then um, it will begin a scale out process, okay? Uh, it does the same thing for scaling in, but it's uh, gonna be a little bit slower scaling in than scaling out. So it, it will use uh, uh, five minutes. Hey, Ravindra, yes, I, it, it should be, I believe. All right, so three minutes out, five minutes in, and it doesn't do one pot at a time, um, it uh, basically does it based upon a formula that Kubernetes HPA uses to determine exactly um, how many uh, uh, pods uh, that it needs, okay? So 
This is our best practice list, my friends. Use HPA, okay? Now, um, and I'll give you this list at the end, my friends, okay? Because I'm getting way more than five. I just can't help myself. Uh, I always get a little, a little excited when it comes to Kubernetes. But um, the other thing that you need to be aware of, um, in order for HPA to, to um, work, you need to install some type of metrics collection facility in your cluster, okay? The, uh, the default metrics collection facility for Kubernetes is called metrics server, okay? Um, though you can use uh, Prometheus uh, to do the same thing. The last thing we talked about was uh, HPA, okay? And quite frankly, HPA is a, uh, a critical component with inside of uh, uh, Kubernetes, okay? And Thomas, let me read up here. So, and, so, and Thomas, you're asking a great question, okay? So, and let's clarify what HPA is doing for me, okay? And this actually bleeds into uh, a little bit larger of, uh, of a discussion. Okay, so HPA is used for um, uh, scaling pods. So um, depending upon how you have uh, it configured, um, you could have HPA scale down to zero, okay? It is possible to actually do that, okay? But remember, uh, or not remember, but HPA, uh, Configurations are usually targeted at um, a um, uh, a specific deployment. So if I had four deployments on Kubernetes, um, I can have four different HPA configurations. Okay. Now I could on all of those specify that the uh, uh, that zero was a bottom number of pods, right? But Remember, HPA does not control worker nodes, okay? HPA controls number of pods, okay? So, uh, so if they're all gone, right, basically, and we have the min set to zero, then what, uh, what Kubernetes will do is it will reduce the number of pods down to your min amount. Now, and since you brought this up, I'm gonna actually, you know, kind of leverage that. Uh, <clears throat> so assuming we're operating in a cloud environment uh, and assuming uh, that uh, the, um, the cloud integration component for Kubernetes is working correctly, which it usually does, uh, then it's possible to have Kubernetes trigger the destruction of uh, several of our uh, uh, processing nodes or worker nodes uh, because they're not needed anymore, okay? So uh, based upon the question that you posted, uh, HPA again doesn't control nodes, it controls pods, but uh, the reduction in the number of pods uh, could uh, trigger the, um, uh, uh, could trigger the um, reduction of the uh, number of processing nodes uh, that exist uh, in your cluster okay so hopefully that addresses the question it's a really good question though really 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 good all right so um hpa very important technology uh and since i brought it up i'm gonna talk about this too uh so um you need uh some way uh, to uh, monitor your cluster, okay? Uh, so, hang on a second, and I'm, I'm gonna give you the, uh... so you need some mechanism uh, to actually do that, okay? So, assuming that there's not a mechanism, mechanism that's in place at this point in time, what I'm showing you right here is the, um, uh, is the uh, de facto standard uh, that we use uh, for the uh, Kubernetes world, okay? Uh, and the, the beautiful thing about this is, is Prometheus, which actually collects metrics, 
uh, can be used with uh, HPA. So if you're using Prometheus, you don't need to, to use the metric server, okay? But Grafana is the uh, visual uh, way uh, to actually see the information. And plus it provides a way to do uh, custom alerting uh, and uh, querying of the, uh, the data that's being collected uh, by uh, Prometheus. So Grafana plus Prometheus, uh, basically a huge, huge tool uh, for us uh, in the Kubernetes world, okay? Uh, wanna make sure that everybody is truly aware of that. And it also can supply the needed metrics that you may need to leverage, okay? Uh, for um, uh, for scaling, okay? All right, but again, just to make sure everybody's clear, HPA, HPA is focused on, um, uh, HPA is focused on pods, right? Because it's a Kubernetes mechanism. Uh, it is possible for the number of pods to be reduced uh, to where the uh, processing power uh, to, uh, uh, keep your cluster up and running correctly um, can allow for the reduction in the number of processing nodes, okay? Uh, so the cloud provider integration uh, would make that possible. And so um, it's, it's a dynamic environment and Kubernetes um, automatically adjusts uh, to the number of nodes uh, and the number of pods. Remember that every single service that makes it possible uh, for us to access uh, a pod's capabilities uh, is tied to the pod uh, through the um, uh, uh, through the label. Okay, labels, labels, labels. Okay, labels aren't necessarily a uh, quote unquote best practice, uh, but you cannot work effectively in Kubernetes. Uh, without leveraging labels. And quite frankly, they are very straightforward, my friends. Uh, they are not overly complex, okay? So, uh, all right, so requests and limits plus HPA, best, best practices, uh, the resource quotas, that's best practice. Uh, there's a couple of other things that I wanna cover with y'all. Uh, in the time that we have left that I think is pretty important, okay? Uh, metric server uh, is uh, with K8, so metric server is probably with K8, and so why would I switch? All right, so, um, hey, Kirk, uh, metric server is available, okay, for your Kubernetes install, okay? Uh, it's not installed by default. Uh, you're gonna have to install it yourself, okay? Uh, is it free? Yep, it's 100% free. Uh, is Prometheus and Grafana free? Yep, they're 100% free. So you asked a really super good question, Kirk, on uh, why would I choose Prometheus Grafana over metric server? Metric server is fairly straightforward, okay? There's really only a couple of metrics that it really is concerned with, and that's uh, CPU and memory that each one of your pods uh, is uh, taking up. Prometheus, on the other hand, and the combination with Grafana, uh, we can monitor both uh, CPU and memory, but we can also monitor everything else that goes along with um, a pod. Uh, tra web traffic, number of requests, number of requests over the next last five minutes, uh, you get the idea. So basically Prometheus is uh, a superset of what um, we can actually accomplish uh, with uh, uh, metric server, okay? So hopefully that, uh, hopefully that makes uh, some sense, okay? All right, so, um, all right. A couple of other things for us that I think are really super important, uh, and these fall under, you know, some of the, content, uh, but that as far as, you know, information about Kubernetes, but they're also best practices, okay? Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I think I can, yeah, I can. I, I think I can um, adequately say 
that all of the best practices that you may know about creating containers, right, and working with just pure Docker, um, really apply to the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem. What I mean is doing things like uh, paying attention to the size of your uh, container images, right, uh, and things like that. So best practices that we follow for regular um, containerization um, also um, applies here. I think that makes some sense, okay? Uh, I think um, um, one of the other things that um, uh, we wanna talk about uh, is uh, security, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna come back to another performance item, I think, uh, here in a minute. Uh, but um, RBAC, okay? Uh, basically, um, uh, Kubernetes uh, operates on a role-based authentication uh, type, of, uh, type of a facility, okay? Uh, so there's a couple of things that I want to comment on here, okay? So use RBAC uh, and um, uh, use uh, external uh, secret storage, okay? All right, so um, what I mean by this, okay, is role-based authentication is exactly as you would expect it to be, okay? So if I look at the dev role, okay, uh, YAML file, you'll see how the uh, role-based authentication is done, okay? So if this role is assigned to you as an individual or you're part of a group that this role is assigned to. That means that you can um, get, watch, and list pods. You can't create them, you can't modify them, but you can get, watch, and list them, okay? Uh, the other one is uh, that you would have access to would be services. Uh, so with that resource, you'll be able to get, watch, and list uh, services, right, uh, as well. So in other words, it's role-based uh, capabilities, okay? So for this particular role, um, I'm providing uh, the capabilities uh, that your user can do, okay? Uh, very, 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 very important, okay? Uh, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look at this file, okay? Of course, I have to be able to type in the commands correctly. Okay. Come on, John. Jeez, please, dude. It's only Wednesday and I'm having problems typing, right? All right. So you remember what the dev role had in it? Okay. It had um, roles associated with pods and services. Okay. So what we need to be able to do is we need to associate um, a user with. Um, a particular role. I think that makes sense, okay? Uh, so you'll notice here, this is what we call a role binding, okay? Uh, this would um, bind um, uh, the role uh, devs with a user named test user. There you go, okay? Uh, now, would I use this in production? Absolutely not. Okay, this information would come out of your LDAP server uh, or some whatever your security uh, tool is that uh, uh, you use. Okay, uh, this would come out of um, Active Directory. Okay, uh, so um, I can actually use that as well. Okay, so this space, by the way, is the file uh, to create the uh, user uh, that you saw. So. Uh, it's not. It, this is not a difficult. Um, this is not a difficult one, my friends. Uh, use role-based authentication. Do not leave pods open. Don't assume just because it's behind your firewall that everything's protected. And you remember one of our um, first best practices that I mentioned right here: namespaces. Don't forget that role-based authentication can be associated with namespaces. 
So what that means is, is I can specify uh, the fundamental roles that are available to anybody that accesses an application in my namespace, okay? Uh, so it makes it possible for me to set some defaults. I hope, that, I hope that's clear to you guys. So set the defaults at the namespace level, use that namespace for, because it, it's really intended for security, right? That's one of its main mechanisms, as well as name collision, and then use um, RBAC uh, for roles that are beyond uh, the, uh, the fundamentals, okay? The ability to like list and watch uh, and uh, do things like that, okay? All right, so RBAC, really, really, really super important, okay? All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about uh, a couple of other items then too, okay? All right, so um, with, with uh, this next piece that I wanna talk about, and by the way, um, there's an example, there's a metric server right there. Metric server's on uh, GitHub, by the way, if you're interested in it, right? Uh, creating namespaces is really easy too, my friends, okay? See that namespace.yaml right there? That, there you go. It, this, that, that YAML file creates a namespace called advanced K8s. Obviously, I could add additional elements into it for configuration, but I think you get the idea, right? Uh, so, a um, couple of things that I want to make you aware of, okay? So, um, you remember that one of the components that we talked about early on uh, was the uh, scheduler, okay? And the scheduler runs on the control plane, and the purpose of the scheduler is to identify where a pod is going to run, and that the scheduler, by default, okay, uses and looks for available memory and CPU, okay? Now, um, let's assume uh, that um, the uh, scheduler needs to be more complex than that, okay? Uh, so let's, let's assume that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it needs to have more um, uh, capabilities than just looking at um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the memory and CPU that are available on a machine uh, when it uh, actually determines where it's gonna be run, okay? And I'm looking for a couple of files here. That's a controller conformer. Uh, let me see if it's in the database. No, that's not the one yet. Uh, hang on a second, you guys. Now we talked about that already. I do believe. All right, I think we've got everything in here that I'm going to use. All right, hang on one second, y'all, uh, because there's something really important that I want to make sure that um, I hit on. And it may be back in. All right, one, one other thing that I will mention, okay. Um, and I think, yeah. In a momento. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of things that we want to that I need to talk about real quick. All right. So um, we're in the process of uh, talking about scheduling, right? So I'm going to finish this up, and then I'm going to come back to something about security 
uh, because it's also going to be an important subject to kind of finish out with. Okay. Uh, but when it comes to scheduling, uh, basically the scheduler in Kubernetes determines where a pod is going to be run based upon CPU and memory availability. Okay. Uh, so um, the um, uh, what, what if, okay, what if I want to um, use a more complex scheduling mechanism? Does that make sense? So actually, let me make it even more exciting than that. What if I want to um, uh, have my pod that I'm trying to schedule only run on machines that have a GPU, okay? Uh, or maybe I only want it to run on machines that have, um, uh, you know, an SSD drive, okay? Or maybe I want to um, influence scheduling uh, based upon other pods that are running in that um, region in AWS, okay? So in other words, I have some different scenarios uh, that I might want to enable beyond just CPU and memory, right? So the question is, is, is there a way to do that? And the answer is, yes, there is, okay? So you'll notice um, I have a file in here that's called Affinity, okay? And um, what, you're, what you'll notice in here, uh, and this one's pretty basic, um, but I think it kind of shows the um, elements of what um, uh, that can be done. You'll notice that under the specification where this is gonna run, okay? It has what's called a node selector, okay? Uh, and basically that means exactly what you think it means. It says node, okay? And so it's going to run this, um, uh, it's gonna run this node, or excuse me, this pod uh, on the node that um, uh, has a uh, label of disk type equals SSD. Ooh. So basically, you and I can influence scheduling uh, of our um, uh, of our pods, okay, uh, through affinity rules. Okay, let me show you some others real quick. These are really, really, really good. So um, uh, the affinity YAML file shows you exactly this. You'll notice this. This is really, 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 really super awesome as well. So. Affinity can be oriented towards the node, but it can also be oriented towards another pod, okay? So basically this affinity rule uh, looks for a uh, label where the uh, app uh, is called, uh, it says app equals store, and then you'll notice there's a topology key there. So what this is gonna do is make sure that this pod is started on the same host where this pod is already running. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, that's just really, really. So there are different scenarios that you and I can actually implement uh, beyond just the standard scheduling, right? Uh, for um, CPU and memory. Okay, so I can do it based upon uh, all different kinds of mechanisms, my friends. Uh, it can be uh, related to the, to the node, okay? It's not uncommon in some of my customers where they have um, uh, container uh, logic that really needs uh, a GPU uh, to actually perform. And so whenever they're deploying that container in a pod, inside the uh, manifest file, they'll specify uh, the, um, the, uh, the key uh, for affinity that says that the, uh, uh, the machine could have a GPU level or label, okay? Uh, to identify it, that it has a GPU on it and all that kind of good stuff, okay? Uh, so there, there's quite a bit um, in that uh, that can be uh, that can be leveraged. Okay, uh, let's see. Let me see if there's anything else in here that uh, 
Yeah, the node affinity, okay. Right, so basically in this particular one, uh, containers, uh, yep, 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 uh, for this, uh, this is this is actually um, uh, doing a, a, a node affinity, okay? Uh, and it's uh, when the nodes are actually uh, labeled with uh, team values, right? Uh, it can be used to determine where they're gonna be deployed at. Uh, and the, uh, Jonathan, you're asking a really good, really, 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 really good question. So. Uh, so if I'm going to look at the pod, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, I'll look at a pod uh, affinity rule. Wow. Yeah. So if I look at a pod affinity rule, so you'll notice this right here, okay, that topology key. Uh, this is what Jonathan is asking about. It's a really good question. And the answer is yes. Uh, the uh, cloud provider provides uh, topology keys. And I, I should have started up an instance of EKS before we started the, our time together. I could have shown you. But uh, for instance, on Amazon, uh, Amazon for each one of the, uh, 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 for, for your cluster, uh, it has topology keys for host name, region, um, uh, availability zones, uh, it's, uh, the uh, OS that's running on the machine, uh, how big the machine is as far as what its CPU capabilities are. So there's quite a bit that can be done. Uh, so you can see, I think what I'm kind of, you know, throwing at you is that there's quite a bit that can be done uh, to influence scheduling beyond just basic CPU and memory, okay? All right, I'm assuming everybody's okay with that. Uh, so, yeah, SSD, GPU, yep, yep, and and you know what the best part about it is too, uh, which I don't know if it's the best part about it, but uh, a good part about it is if the label doesn't exist, uh, you can add it if you need to. You could actually write a quick script to add that uh, uh, if necessary. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Two more topics that I want to um, want to run through with you, okay? Uh, and uh, so the the first one um, has to do uh, with um, uh, secret information, okay? Uh, and then I'm going to come back to um, I'm going to come back to uh, uh, something. A little bit more exciting, but secret information, uh, basically referring to um, um, keys. When I, when I talk about secrets, I mean username and password, keys, um, all this kind of stuff. Okay, uh, so uh, let me see. Uh, Kubernetes uh, actually has a mechanism. Uh, for managing uh, secrets, okay, uh, and uh, and actually it doesn't show you in here, okay, uh, but the secrets allow allow me uh, beyond just you know putting stuff in for property files, uh, the the secrets uh, are there to make it so that they can't be easily stolen, okay. Uh, so what I want to um, uh, and what I have put in kind of our best practices right here is you'll notice that whenever you're using RBAC, you should use something external for your secret storage. So um, I guess kind of where I'm trying to land this is that um, Kubernetes did a really good job. The team did a pretty good job on differentiating between property values that are used for configuration and stuff like that versus things that should be kept secret. Okay. The problem is, is that the secrets uh, would often find their way into files that were checked into um, version control. And by the way, I know that you know that that's bad, okay? So um, several companies have come up uh, with opportunities 
to integrate their secret storage into Kubernetes. Uh, one of those is uh, HashiCorp, okay? HashiCorp has a uh, vault uh, that can uh, make its secrets retrievable uh, by uh, Kubernetes at runtime, so none of that secret information ever makes it into um, a, um, uh, a file that then potentially would be checked into um, uh, source control, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, hopefully you get that, right? All right, there's one more thing that I wanna cover real quick, okay? Uh, and uh, it has to do with init containers, okay? Well, before I do that, let me see if I have this, I should. Uh, I know I do over here. Deployments, config affinity, services. Let me see if it's in the. Uh, no, it's not there. All right, I'll talk you through one piece of it and then uh, we'll look at its capabilities uh, in another, because I don't think, I don't see the example. All right, so uh, Kubernetes has a mechanism for um, all pods, okay, and the containers that are running in them to determine two things, okay? Uh, by default, Kubernetes determines that a uh, container uh, or a pod is running successfully and it has not died by just basic OS type stuff, okay? Is the process running uh, and can it be accessed? But Kubernetes added onto that uh, and made it possible for you to um, uh, uh, integrate into that what's called an init container and a status and, and a status container. So an init probe and a status probe. Okay. So the init probe basically determines when the uh, pod can start receiving requests, and the uh, status probe is used to determine um, if the uh, pod is successfully still up and running. I think that makes sense. The problem is, is that if we try to use those uh, for um, uh, you know, determining that our, our entire application is online and ready to run. Uh, it's really good for individual containers, uh, individual pods, but it's not really, really that good for, you know, something that's a little bit more robust, okay? So, in order to solve that problem, okay, we have this concept called an init container, okay? Uh, and so, I'm gonna show you what an init container looks like. Uh, in this particular case, um, the init containers are built upon, built on the busy box, box image, and they just use a command that's specified in the uh, deployment file. Uh, technically, they don't have to be that way, but you get the idea. So basically, to interpret this, what this means is this is your main container right here, okay, inside this pod. But requests will not be routed to this pod until both of these init containers have successfully executed, okay? Uh, so in the event that, um, that uh, the NS lookup for uh, my service is not running correctly, uh, then this container will not start. Uh, in the event that my DB can't be identified right, and, and determine it's up and started, then this container uh, won't start, okay? Uh, so if you look at uh, the uh, Nginx YAML here, here's the service, uh, and actually this is doing the, uh, this is doing a similar component. Uh, let me see if I see services YAML here. Yeah, there's MyDB right there, uh, and then there is the service called MyService, okay? Uh, so basically, um, when the uh, init uh, can see both of those services, then it will 
basically allow Kubernetes then as an infrastructure to start routing requests uh, to, um, uh, to this pod, okay? So init containers uh, are really kind of important components. Use uh, init uh, containers. This is a best practice, my friends, okay? Don't rely, don't just rely on, um, don't just rely on uh, uh, status probes and init probes, okay? Readiness probes, that's not gonna be enough. Init containers are your mechanism for determining that. All right, so namespaces, we've talked about readiness, liveness. Uh, uh, we've talked about limits, right? Uh, we've talked about RBAC. Um, uh, we've talked about the basics of uh, your uh, Docker best practices, right? That we uh, that you probably already know about. Uh, we talked about using a uh, cluster that is supplied by a cloud provider, right? Um, multiple nodes, all that kind of good stuff. All right. All right. So I want to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, a couple of items for the quote unquote future. Okay. And I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you a link that in, in my most humble opinion um, is going to address uh, quite a bit of it. Okay. Uh, so this link right there uh, that I just gave you uh, is this screen right here. Okay. Many Kubernetes um, operators are not familiar with this or developers are not familiar with uh, this, uh, this concept, okay? So inside Kubernetes, Kubernetes is essentially made up of a bunch of um, manifest uh, structures, right? A manifest structure for deployment, pods, services, you get it. And we basically said in our time together, that using pods is a, or not using pods, using deployments is a best practice, okay? But what if there is something that is not adequately um, expressed in one of those uh, formats? What if there's something that uh, is beyond that, okay? Well, that's where the operator comes into play, okay? Uh, when we talk about futures in Kubernetes, okay, uh, this is kind of what we see happening. Uh, so think of Kubernetes K8 uh, as a base infrastructure that is going to allow us to uh, build just about any type of solution that we want to on top of it. The problem with that is that there has to be uh, resource definitions for all the components that we may want or need. How can we make that happen? It's a good question. It's a real good question, as a matter of fact. And that's what the operator pattern does for us. I more than encourage you to get familiar with the operator pattern, okay? Uh, probably the most popular um, operator pattern implementation uh, that we today use with Kubernetes has to do with Prometheus and uh, uh, Grafana, okay? Prometheus and Grafana have uh, an operator implementation that allows us to, uh, you know, do the installation of it, okay? Uh, it has all of its customized uh, resource definitions. It has all of its custom code. Everything is included in kind of one component. So when we talk about futures, okay, uh, so... Uh, Futures basically is a lot of it is around uh, custom um, components. Okay, and I am making this into a list, by the way, uh, so that I'll have something to 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 kind of so custom components, right? So futures, custom components, right? Uh, and I'll put in here uh, operators, uh, really super gigantically uh, going to be important. Okay. So that's number one, okay? The second element that you're gonna actually see, um, I think, uh, because of what we can do with operators, right? I think everything begins there, by the way. Uh, what uh, what um, Kubernetes really does not have right now is a mature API gateway, okay? 
Uh, so if you're familiar with AWS, Azure, uh, GCS, they all have, uh, you know, API gateways, okay? Uh, and uh, this is what the ingress controller uh, was supposed to be in uh, Kubernetes, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna say uh, ingress 2.0, okay? Uh, so we, one of the uh, key elements that we should be seeing uh, in the future is a brand new ingress controller mechanism uh, that's gonna make it possible for you and me uh, to use one type of service and route to um, any um, uh, back-end pod uh, that we might want to, okay? Right now, um, our services, for the most part, um, are usually tied uh, to a specific type of pod, okay? What an ingress controller will make possible for us uh, is it will make it possible, uh, or, and actually ingress controller 2.0, uh, it will make a uh, high performance um, service that can route to many different uh, pods on the back end. Okay. So these are two big future items uh, that uh, we would expect uh, to see inside the product uh, in the coming uh, in the coming months. Okay. All right. I'm taking every bit of that and I just dumped it out into chat, my friends. Uh, so the first part, uh, you know, starting with namespace, those are kind of our best practices. And actually, I'll I'll title that for us, right? Best practices, right? Uh, and the bottom part has to do with uh, two of the big futures. And by the way, the operator pattern is huge, gigantic. All right. What questions, comments, anything that you have that we want to wrap up before the end of our time? Uh, let's see, um, Jonathan, products like Kong, yeah, it should. Uh, yeah, the uh, API gateway uh, really should become the mechanism inside of Kubernetes to route uh, to backend pods. So right now we use ingress controllers for a lot of that purpose, right? Um, and uh, what we really see happening is that being taken away. Uh, Rancher, Rancher is really good for managing your cluster. It is. Uh, so um, uh, <clears throat> uh, I actually use Rancher with a, a group of folks in class. Um, actually, um, Rancher does put a level of abstraction between you and the, the cluster itself, but it does allow us to, from one location, manage uh, multiple uh, clusters um, from one kind of UI. So yeah, Albert, um, for what it's worth, um, I, would throw, I would throw Rancher in there as well, uh, not necessarily as a must-have, uh, but as something that... Uh, should be looked at, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, Bomsi, yeah, I'll work with WebAge on that, okay? And the uh, the content that they have for you guys, you should have a lot of this stuff in there to begin with. So we'll make sure that you're taken care of. No worries, y'all have been great. Other questions? We got about 12 minutes or so. All right. If not, hey, it's been great having you. I hope it's been worth your time. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to uh, see each other maybe in a class in the future. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, go out and shed, uh, share the uh, best practices and love of uh, Kubernetes.